His Majesty's yacht, Iolair, was heading towards the Western Isles with over 200 sailors on board, all looking forward to seeing their family and friends at New Year 1919. Most of them never made it. At 7.30 on the evening of Tuesday 31st December 1918, the boat had left Kyle of Lachaus, heading for Stornoway on the Isle of Lewis. On board were around 283 men, although no records exist to give the exact number, but it was more than should have been on board. They had travelled to Kyle of Lachaus by train from Inverness, and for some it was their first home leave in four years. It was a clear, moonless night, the sea calm, until they neared Lewis when the winds picked up and the sea became rough. Just before 2am on New Year's Day 1919, as she approached Stornoway, the boat was carried across the mouth of the harbour, hit rocks known as the Beasts of Home on her broadside and sank beneath the waves at 3.25am, just a few yards from shore. The lifeboats had been lowered, but were quickly swamped, so men had jumped into the water, going under quickly and not seen alive again. The official death toll was 205, with 174 men from Lewis and seven from neighbouring Harris losing their lives. Five families lost two sons in the disaster. John Finlay MacLeod from Ness saved 40 lives by swimming ashore with a heaving line, allowing the sailors to make it to safety. What made it difficult for more to survive was their clothing. They were wearing their uniforms, heavy coats and boots, and the boat went down so quickly they had little time to remove their garments. In many cases, the sailors hadn't learnt to swim either. One man, 20-year-old Donald Morrison, was seen sometime after nine o'clock in the morning clinging to the mast and was rescued. But his brother, Angus, who was also on the boat, perished. Donald MacLeod managed to get to shore, but not being able to see his brother Malcolm, he swam back out to try and find him. Both drowned. Another set of brothers on board were John, Angus and Norman MacPhail. John and Angus survived, but Norman was lost. A temporary mortuary was set up at the naval battery in the shed, with the bodies being laid out so families could identify their loved ones. Their personal belongings were placed in brown paper bags and numbered, with the dead having the same number chalked on the soles of their boots or on a tag that had been tied to their clothing. In the end, only 82 on board Iolair survived. Queen Alexandra sent a message of condolence, saying that she was deeply distressed at the unspeakably sad disaster which had befallen our dear sailors at Stornoway. Please convey my utmost and deepest sympathy to the relatives at the heartrending calamity that deprived them of those nearest and dearest to them at the moment of their return home after their splendid services in the past four years. A disaster fund was set up in the days following so the public could donate to the bereaved families as well as the survivors. Among those to donate was the Navy League Overseas Relief Fund, which sent £2,000 to Stornoway, and William Lever, Lord Leverhulme, who donated £1,000. In all, over £29,000 was raised with the final payments being made in January 1938 
when the last children of those who had died turned 18. An inquiry into the disaster took place at Stornoway on 10th February 1919, before Sheriff Principal McIntosh. Also present was a jury, Mr J. C. Fenton, advocate, and Mr G. C. Mackenzie, the Procurator Fiscal of Stornoway, who conducted the case for the Crown. Mr J. C. Pittman, an advocate from Edinburgh, and Mr W. A. Ross, a solicitor from Stornoway, acted on behalf of the Admiralty, while Mr J. N. Anderson, solicitor in Stornoway, acted on behalf of some of the survivors and the families. Leading seaman Angus Nicholson told the court that the boat had changed course just before she hit the rocks. He said no orders were given from the bridge or by any of the officers or crew. He called for the whistle to be blown, which it was, but no orders came regarding the lifeboats or life belts. Kenneth MacLeod, a seaman, said the boat had been following the course of a fishing boat ahead. Iolair's light had been on the starboard bow but switched to the port side and soon after that she'd struck the rocks. The fishing boat made it safely to port. James McLean, who'd been on the Iolair since February 1916, had seen Commander Mason and the navigating officer, Lieutenant Cotter, before they'd left Kyle of Lochalsh, and both were sober. Cotter relieved Mason, and he said that Cotter told him to go below and change the watch 25 minutes before Iolair hit, as he expected to be in Stornoway in 20 minutes. Some time after she'd hit, he heard Commander Mason on the bridge saying something about boats, but no orders were given. The searchlight wasn't used, and he couldn't say why. There were also three guns on board, but they weren't fired to raise the alarm. During the inquiry, Lieutenant Commander Morish of the Royal Navy stated that the Iolair had been fitted with a wireless radio, but on the night of the incident, the operators had been unable to get it working. John McLean and Duncan Mackenzie of the local lifeboat had been summoned on the morning of the wreck, but were informed that due to the position of the boat, they could be of no assistance. The signalman at the battery, William Saunders, had been on duty between 12 midnight and 4 a.m. in the morning of 1st January 1919 and had noticed two steamers' lights as they approached Stornoway. One came into the harbour, but the other seemed to be further east than it should have been. The boat showed a blue light, meaning that a pilot was required to take her into the harbour. Soon after this, a red flare was released, and he tried to communicate with the boat using a Morse lamp, but it didn't work. Robert Ainsdale, the officer of the watch at the battery, told the court that at 1.50 that morning, the signalman had reported a vessel off home head showing a blue light. He telephoned the rear admiral and was told the pilot would be sent out. At 2.15, he saw a red rocket and again phoned the Admiral, who said assistance was coming and to get the life-saving apparatus ready and get it to the scene of the wreck. He believed it left the barracks at 3 a.m. He also sent a message to the Coast Guards. All the witnesses in the inquiry stated that none of the sailors had shown any sign of intoxication, contrary to rumours that had been going about. During his summing up, Mr Fenton told the jury it was possible the navigator of the Iolair, having seen the other vessel making towards Stornoway Harbour but on a different course, probably would have slackened speed. 
He also expected that it was the duty of the navigation officer to have had a competent lookout. One problem was that the witnesses couldn't agree on whether the yacht had changed course just before she struck the rocks, and that changing course a few minutes earlier would have made a difference. However, all the witnesses agreed that no orders were given after she struck, and no attempt was made to get the men to their boat stations. He also suggested revising the arrangements for the life-saving apparatus. Mr Pittman told the jury the Admiralty had welcomed the inquiry and Commander Bradley, who'd been called, stated that Lieutenant Cotter, the navigator, was careful and competent in his duties. Pittman said the jury shouldn't find fault with anyone on the boat. With the Admiralty, who had also conducted their own inquiry, also not finding anyone at fault. It was simply an error of judgment. Mr. Anderson, on behalf of the families, was grateful that it was now on record that none of the sailors had been drunk at the time of the disaster. However, he suggested that there had been gross mismanagement and carelessness on board after the vessel had struck the rocks. Sheriff McIntosh summed up, saying that it was an unfortunate circumstance that the accident had taken place at a time when it was usually happy. He attached great importance to the witness statement of Captain Cameron of the steamer Sheila, who had seen the Iolair at Kyle of Lochage which was also carrying sailors and soldiers home to the islands and had arrived an hour later. He said that she'd been keeping her course. The sheriff said that the keeping of that course as the yacht approached Stornoway Harbour for just a few minutes too long had been the cause of the incident. However, there was some evidence of a communication breakdown after she'd struck. The jury retired and after an hour they returned a unanimous verdict. Their findings included that the Iolair had hit the rocks at the Beasts of Home around 1.55 that January morning, resulting in the deaths of 205 men. They concluded that the officer in charge didn't take enough care when approaching the harbour and that the yacht didn't slow down, while there was also no lookout at the time of the accident. There were also not enough life belts, only 80. Not enough lifeboats, as they were lucky if the ones they had could hold a hundred men, and there was no other life-saving apparatus on board for the number of souls who were on the boat that night. There was also a breakdown in communication as no orders were issued by Lieutenant Cotter or Commander Mason and time was lost between the time of the distress signals and the arrival of help. One of the recommendations was that a light be erected by the Northern Lighthouse Board on the home side of the harbour. There was already one on the Arnish Point side. The jury also requested that seaman John MacLeod be recommended to the Carnegie Trust and the Royal Humane Society for his actions in saving the 40 men. They also thanked Mr and Mrs Anderson Young of Stonyfield Farm in appreciation of their hospitality to the sailors who had arrived on their doorstep. Many of the families, however, thought the inquiry was a whitewash. On Tuesday, 1st January 2019, Scotland's First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon, and the then Prince Charles, Duke of Rothsey, now King Charles III, attended a memorial service on the disaster's 100th anniversary. A memorial was unveiled at home to the men who lost their lives that winter's night. <laughs> 